Writing Out Loud. A program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is best-selling author Carl Hyacin. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on. You started out professionally as a general assignment reporter. <laughs> what were some of the most important lessons you learned in Cocoa, Florida? Oh, and starting as a reporter, uh, well, the, the most valuable thing I think you learn, and I think a, a reason a lot of novelists come from a journalistic mm -hmm. background is that you learn to write fast and, and under almost any <laughs> distracted conditions. Because in those days, the, the big newsrooms, I mean, and noisy phones ringing, people screaming. Mm -hmm and you still had to sit down and write on deadline. So what it taught you was you wrote every day whether you felt like there was no mm -hmm. writer's block. Mm -hmm. And um, you, it, it, it sort of instilled a discipline for writing. It's very valuable when you, when you start mm -hmm. novels because it's easy to get distracted and find reasons not to write. Well, you can't do that in a newsroom. You have to produce. <laughs> Were there any journalists you looked to as mentors? Well, sure. When I was young, um, uh, as an aspiring columnist, Pete Hamill and Jimmy Breslin were my heroes, Mike Royko, and, and I later was, was lucky enough to become friends with Pete and Jimmy. But when I got into the business was in the middle of Watergate. I graduated uh, from the University of Florida Journalism School right as Watergate was cresting. So obviously, every, all of us wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. I mean, that, that was... It was a very uh, energizing time to be a young journalist, and then newspapers were thriving. Um, uh, it was it was a, a much different time than it is now. Mm -hmm. For over 20 years now, you've had a high-profile column in the Miami Herald, and I wondered if you might give us postscripts to two of your recent subjects, uh, both of them pretty controversial. Let's start with Ariel Castro. Oh, the uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was such a horrible story, and as long as you're in, a, in, in the news business, you think you've heard and seen everything, but occasionally a story comes down that hor horrifies you, and this guy in Cleveland that you know, kidnapped these girls and locked them up for all these years, and um, I guess you developed kind of a cynical side, and so, you know, he, he, he killed himself in, in prison, and I remember reading a couple columns uh, by people saying well, it was the last cowardly act he deprived these mm -hmm. girls of justice and mm -hmm. I thought no we didn't deprive them of anything I mean having had some experience writing about these cases uh, I thought the, the, the proper response to this is good riddance mm -hmm. he saved everybody a lot of grief and he, and he closed the chapter for these girls because mm -hmm. otherwise he's alive in jail for the rest of his life, and they know he's alive, and they know he's, and and he's probably giving TV interviews, and he's probably writing a book, and he's he's mm -hmm. a constant reminder of that nightmare they went through. So as when he, when he hung himself, I said, you know, mm -hmm. scratch goodbye, good, you know, adios, you know. I mean, it sounds cold-hearted, but what he did was was a thousand times worse. So you know, I I, I don't have. You know, you 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 see enough, and, and it, it's a business that you see and you hear a lot of things, and it, it you you lose patience after a while. For you know, there's just certain crimes that you just say, you know what, mm -hmm. you got to move on. And then the Zimmerman prosecution mm -hmm. team. Well, you know, when George Zimmerman was um, indicted, that 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 kid should never have been killed. It should never have gotten mm -hmm. to the point where that that young man was shot, and. Um, but knowing the Florida justice system and knowing mm -hmm. uh, Central Florida juries, I, I, when, when he was first indicted for second degree murder, I mean, I did a column then and I said, there's no way that this is, he's ever going mm -hmm. to get convicted of second degree murder. It requires a frame of mind, it requires a malice that even the worst evidence, the worst thing you could say about mm -hmm. this guy. You know, he, got, he panicked, he, he, he was Mr. Vigilante, but he didn't set out that day to shoot somebody. Um, or even, I mean, he, he, he just was surprised, and he was surprised when the guy confronted him, and it turned into this fatal confrontation. But I thought they overcharged him. I wrote the comps saying this is, is, is going to be a very, very tough case to, to win. And so when he was acquitted, I can't, I can't say I was terribly surprised. And, um, you know, it was just it was one of those tragic things and, and leaving a lot of people very unsatisfied. A lot of expectations mm -hmm. were raised by that indictment that I thought were unfortunate because uh, you go for, in that case you go for a manslaughter. And even then it's a tough, mm -hmm. tough, tough case to make. Do you ever second guess yourself as a columnist? No, you know, no. I mean, I, I, when I write the column, you write from the heart and you have, you have your facts right and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 
you better have your facts, right? And the rest of it is just what you feel in your heart. So a lot of it is opinion. Now there, you know, there are certain uh, times I think I wasn't hard enough, mm -hmm. on somebody. but I don't think I was ever too tough, especially when you're dealing with issues of corruption and public corruption, which is mm -hmm. uh, pandemic in Florida <laughs> um, uh, and those kinds of things. I don't think you can be too hard on anybody who's taking a bribe mm -hmm. or misusing a public office for his own or her mm -hmm. own benefit. Um, so no, I, my only, you know, you know, my only regret were there were times when I think I should have been even nastier than I was. What's been the most surprising reaction you've gotten to one of your columns? I did a column once about Robert Vesco. I don't know if mm -hmm. you remember. He was a he was a big time financier who got mm -hmm. in trouble, and he he fled the country. He was a real mm -hmm. rich guy, given a lot to political parties. He fled the country, got indicted on some fraud charges, and he ended up in Cuba, of all ironic places. <laughs> the hotbed of socialism, this great big capitalist ended up there and, and under the protection of the Fidel Castro government because he paid him off. So I wrote a kind of funny kind of scathing article about this guy. Nobody liked Vesco. Nobody. I mean, he, <laughs> yeah. he was a, you know, he was a bad guy. But I get a call at the, in the newsroom from a guy who uh, was upset about the column and he said he was going to kill me. Now, that didn't happen that often. In, mm -hmm. in Miami, you don't necessarily take it seriously. And, and so I keep him on the phone. I said, what are you going to kill me for? And he said, well, and he was, turns out he was the captain of, of Bob Vesco's yacht. And now he was out of a job because his, his boss was in Cuba. The yacht had been, you know, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. sitting in a marina somewhere. And he was all upset because what a, I besmirched Bob. He was really a great guy, Bob Vesco, blah, blah, blah. Get him on the phone. I calm him down. Mm -hmm. And, he, and at the end of the conversation, he, he says, I'm going to bring you something at the Herald. I'm not sure what he's going to bring me. <laughs> this guy just threatened to kill me. But anyway, he comes by and he brings me the, a brochure. He says, hey, I'd really like it if you could write a column. It was about Vesco's yacht, and he wanted to see if I could help him sell the yacht. I mean, so, but that was the sort of thing, you know, it was out of left field. Yeah. And um, uh, anyway, but it was just uh, typical wacky Florida stuff. <laughs> For a number of years, one of your colleagues at the Herald was Dave Barry. Mm -hmm. Explain the synergy between <laughs> you guys. Well, we've been friends for a long time. Uh, Dave and I worked together on the, the Herald Sunday Magazine, Tropic, for years, and he did his humor column originally for Tropic, and I was writing my me Metropolitan column at the Herald, and then we both started working on fiction um, and, and books on our own, and so we would tell book stories and uh, uh, to each other, but we just stayed close, and he has a, he has a band <laughs> uh, a, a band called the Rock Bottom Remainders yeah. of Authors, and I call it my, I call it authors who own musical instruments. <laughs> but um, Dave's actually a pretty good guitar player, yeah. and he's got some good players, Mitch Album, people like that yeah. can actually play Ridley Pearson. But um, he, I've sat in a couple times with a guitar; I can't play worth a lick. Um, so I would go down for the Miami Book Fairs and do that. And I still talk to Dave occasionally, but he. But we, we both, I mean, he was not, he's from New York State, so he, he I was from Florida, but he, he and I both looked at Florida the same way as this incredible gold mine uh, for, for writers. The material is so rich, it's, it's demented, it's, it's uh, sick and twisted, but if you're a writer, <laughs> Whether you're a journalist or novelist, it is a, it's a place that's hard to beat for just sheer inspiration. Your first novel, Powder Burn, was a collaboration. Mm -hmm. How did that get kick-started? Well, I did, I did three books with Bill Montalban. He was a dear friend of mine. He was an editor at the mm -hmm. Herald, very talented, gifted writer. We didn't, we, we were, our styles were completely different. Mm -hmm. But he, Bill had come to me one day and said, uh, and he was a foreign correspondent as well at the Herald, and he'd come to me and said, that, you know, um, we, it was right when the cocaine wars were starting in Miami, a very violent time in Miami in the uh, early 70s. And, um, and, and it lasted through most of the 70s. And, and I had been writing a lot about some of these true life characters, mm -hmm. assassins, mm -hmm. horrible people that were mm -hmm. shooting people in the streets. And he said, you know, this stuff is so good, we ought to write a book. And, I, and, I'd, and I'd written, I'd worked on a couple books in college for other people. And, uh, and I'd always wanted to get, I'd always wanted to write novels, obviously. So Bill and I did, a, did five chapters. We alternated some of the characters. But we had come up with this homogenous voice. They were kind of tr mm -hmm. tr thrillers. And so n n nobody who knew us knew which of us had written which parts of the book. We, we, it's incredible, and, and really. We, yeah, it's hard to do in uh -huh. fiction. And, but we edited each other brutally because you learn that in the newsroom. You don't get your feelings hurt. But we worked well together. <laughs> And we, so we did five chapters, and I found, through Pete Hamill, I mm -hmm. found a, an agent, 
we send it off. And then we go back to our newspaper jobs. About two weeks later, she calls and says she's, she sold the book based on these five chapters. And I call Bill, all excited. And I said, Bill, we just sold, I think we just sold this book. And he goes, God, he goes, does that mean we've got to write the rest of it? And I said, yeah, now we've got to write the rest of it. So anyway, we wrote the three books together, and they did pretty well. And then um, I started off on, on my own books. Tourist Season was the first one, and Bill went off and wrote his own. And he, yeah. and he was stationed in China for many years for us. I also want to ask about another collaboration you did that involved Elmore Leonard and a number of writers. Oh, oh yes. Tell yeah. us about... You're, you're very kind to use the word collaboration. Yeah. Right. Tell us about <laughs> Naked Came the Manatee. Well, this, was, this book was the idea of a, an editor at Tropic named Tom Schroeder, somebody at Sunday Magazine at the Herald. And he was, it was a spoof on a book that had been done by a bunch of, of uh, writers for Newsday in mm -hmm. New York. Uh, called Naked Came the Stranger, which was sort of a soft porn novel. Mm -hmm. but, and uh, <laughs> it was like 50 chapters written by 50 people who never knew what anyone else was writing. And they threw it all together. And of course, it sold just because of the title. So this was going to be serialized in the Sunday paper, Naked Came the Manatee. And each of us had a chapter assigned. Dave Barry had the first one. He was smart enough to take the first chapter, which meant he could <laughs> write anything he wanted. <laughs> But I was stupid enough to take the last chapter, which meant all the other chapters landed on my desk, and I had to tie up all these disparate ends from 13 writers, including Elmore Leonard, who was a, a, a good friend of mine and of Dave's. And uh, it was, I have to say, it was a, uh, it was a mess. I mean, it was f fun if you're a reader, but for a, as, a, as a writing chore when you get, for instance, I got all these chapters as they piled up. By the end of what I was looking at, they had three severed heads, three different severed heads of Fidel Castro in there. And then I had to somehow explain them all because people had written their chapters and bailed out. So it was, and, and Dutch, Elmore Leonard had the last one before I did and he was late with it. And I couldn't do mine until I had his, you know. I couldn't finish mm -hmm. the book. And if I called him up in Detroit and I said, man, I don't want to bug you, but I got it. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, I got to do that chapter. He goes, okay, okay, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. So he called him back in a couple of days. He goes, okay, here's what I did. He goes, I left you three dead bodies. They can be anybody you want. At the end of my chapter, there's three bodies. And I hope that helps you out. That was the way the book was put together. And I mean, that's real literature for you. And, and he's laughing and I'm laughing. And so we just tied it up and, you know, we put, and, and, uh, and we gave our, Dave and I, they decided to make a book out of it, take all this out of paper and put it into a book. And Dave and I agreed if the proceeds of, of, that we were getting would go to charity. So that's, because we couldn't, I said, well, I looked at him and said, we cannot take money for this. This is, he says, you're right, no, we can't. <laughs> so. As a journalist, you've always been praised for your accuracy, always working so hard to get the facts right. What's the appeal of fiction for you? Well, it's a lot of things. I mean, I enjoy the, 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 the freedom, the muscle that you exercise when you write a, a novel, mm -hmm. the story, the characters are yours. And you can, I mean, obviously I, I borrow and steal shamelessly from the headlines in Florida <laughs> because they're very rich, but um, the creative exercise of writing, uh, you know, a 100,000 word novel versus uh, an 800 word column is, is quite different. And uh, it's quite challenging. I, the books are supposed to be funny. so. You know, you want people smiling, laughing on every page, and you just, at the same time you want them turning the pages. So mm -hmm. you're walking this tightrope. It, it's it's uh, artistically uh, 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 it remains a very very challenging thing to do. The best part is you get to write your own endings, which <laughs> you you never get to do in journalism. And one of my great one of the great lessons you learn early as a reporter, and there's it's a sad lesson in a way, because um, I mean the, the old saying is they don't they don't send you to the airport when the plane lands safely. And that's, right. that's true. So right. you, you, you get to write a lot of stories that end in ways that you wish did not end for the people involved, for the victims, right. for the families. In my books, they end exactly as I want them. And the bad guys come to horrible, mm. horrible ends. I take great delight in knocking them off. Um, the, the, the people who deserve to end up, you know, having good things happen to them, that happens to them too. It's a very selfish, exercise this novel writing, but it, it, mm -hmm. but it also sort of cleanses you a little bit. It gets, mm -hmm. You get to do it the way you want. Your new novel, Bad Monkey, pulled from the headlines? A lot of it. The, the, this is about a Medicare fraudster, and, and, <laughs> and South Florida is the, is the Medicare fraud capital of the United States, not surprisingly. <laughs> it's also the identity, identity theft capital of the United States. All of these figure into this. Um, the, um, it's about a, a cop who's been busted from 
his detective's job down to the what he considers to be the lowly position mm. of a restaurant inspector, mm -hmm. or we <laughs> call it Roach Patrol in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not really, it's a really important yeah. job actually, and he's got to sort of adjust and take all his detective skills, and now he's inspecting kitchens for roaches and vermin, and you know, and he's trying to get his old job back. Um, uh, but, um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of it is, is just stuff that I wrote about, and then the characters uh, spring from a lot of different places. People, some, some of them I actually know, some of them you, mm -hmm. you pick up from newspaper articles, but you just, you know, your job as a novelist is to just uh, tell a story, in my case, a funny, is tell it in a funny mm -hmm. way, uh, and, and do it in a way that people close the book and, and they feel good about it, and they've had a good time. And, and well, back when I was writing the thrillers with Bill Malabano that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I mean, those books had to be satisfying in a different way. Um, but there was a structure and a formula to writing that kind of a book. Mm -hmm. W w you're really, truly on a sort of on a on a high wire with when you're writing satire and humorous mm -hmm. fiction because it, one wrong word in a sentence and it's not funny anymore. Mm -hmm. So you you spend a lot of time agonizing over the timing of uh, the scenes. Dialogue becomes extremely important, mm -hmm. it, it, especially if you're trying to make it funny. The characters have to have to really sparkle on the page, mm -hmm. good and bad. Mm -hmm. And they all come from you, so you can't, it, even the most rotten characters, you're responsible yeah. for them. Well, and, and Yancey's an enigma. I mean, he has a human arm in the freezer, and yes. yet he reads yeah. Margaret Atwood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I threw that in there. I just did an event with her in New York, and she mentioned that to me. She said she, was, <laughs> she thinks she was flattered by that. She's not sure. Um, yeah, I mean, again, you're trying to give dimensions to these characters. Mm -hmm. it, it, could it be honest with you, it's, it's what one thing of, uh, that you learn in a newsroom, I mean, about good and evil is that evil certainly exists, but you can sit down in a prison cell and interview someone who's done something that you or I would consider mm. to be patently evil, and, there, and all of a sudden there's a human spark. You bring up something that he or she is touched by, and you see this, you see this other side. Not that they're good, but that you see that at one point, somewhere along the line, they were a salvageable human being, and now they've turned into this. But when you're making characters that you want people to remember, you have to give, you, you can't do cardboard characters. Right. You can't do all good, all, all evil. Right. You have to give them a backstory. Well, let's talk about Bonnie. Her backstory <laughs> takes us to Oklahoma. Of course. Well, yes, I've been, you know, we have these cases in Florida. We, we read about them all over the country. Bonnie was a teacher in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. a high school teacher who became involved with, romantically with one of her students. Um, and, uh, and you see these on tabloid TV mm -hmm. all the time. And, uh, and so I just said, okay, what happens if you've got one of those, these teachers, and, and there is a romance there, mm -hmm. illicit as it is, mm -hmm. and she decides she's not going to jail, she goes on the lamp. And she takes off and she ends up in Florida where many, many fugitives come. <laughs> because if you're gonna be a fugitive, you might as well go where the weather is warm and yeah. it's nice. I mean, that's the, the thinking. So she ends up under a different name, married to a, mm -hmm. uh, a crooked uh, uh, doctor, dermatologist, who was running a pain clinic, which we have uh, an abundance <laughs> of in Florida, the Oxy Clinics. Uh, she's not in, happy in her marriage. She gets involved with Yancey. He has no idea who she mm -hmm. is or her mm -hmm. backstory. And then, without giving too much away, her ex, the, the kid that she was involved mm -hmm. with, now grown up, uh, still carrying a torch for her, mm -hmm. she, she hooks up with him again. Um, yeah, she is interesting. I like her. I mean, I like, and, and she's, and she's, she's kind of smart. I mean, mm -hmm. I, mo I've written a lot of, a uh, lot of novels with, um, where the, in my view, the, 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 the female characters are about three steps ahead of all the male characters. <laughs> uh, even in a book I wrote called Striptease, which was made yes. into a movie. I always loved that character, Erin. She was the, she, not only for the moral grounding that she had, despite the job that she had to take, but she was always smart. She was always, ahead of all the guys in her life. And mm -hmm. I think that's been my own personal experience, so it's easy for me to give, the, give the, the female characters in the novels that same edge. What about the monkeys? Now the monkey, here's the deal with the monkey. There is a bad monkey in the book, and obviously <laughs> it's a really bad monkey, but you, I, know, I know I've heard lots of monkey stories since mm -hmm. this book came out, and none of them are good. I haven't anybody come up to me and said, well, I have the best pet monkey in the world. They all come up with a, a terrible, nightmarish story. Oh. Uh, bottom line is monkeys are just not reliable, and this is a bad one. And, um, <laughs> but I got this idea because um, 
when John, part of the book takes place in the Bahamas. When Johnny yeah. Depp was down there filming the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, they filmed on an island chain called Exuma. Uh, and, and they have a monkey in it, one of these little monkeys in the movie. And I know from dealing with Hollywood a little bit, they, you don't just show up with one monkey on the mm -hmm. set. When they're filming, they have like a whole boxcar full of monkeys, and each of them is trained to do something mm -hmm. a little different. So I just got in mind, what if one of them went bad on the mm -hmm. set, went rogue, as Sarah Palin would say. <laughs> And, um, and then was fired off the set of the movie in the Bahamas and was just sort of said, you're on your own, monkey. And that's this, mo this poor monkey's <laughs> drifted around. He, he, his show business career is now over, so he's got a pretty lousy attitude and he ends up interacting mm. with Yancey. But, I, but you know, every, every movie you see nowadays has a, a monkey in it, mm. all the hangover mm. movies. So I said, I'm, what kind of, mine's going to really be a bad one. Well, yeah, he is. Yeah. He's got a smoking problem, <laughs> yeah, all kinds of yeah. things. Well, you get, yeah, the cigarettes are a problem. That's not an attractive quality in a monkey. <laughs> we don't have time to do justice to all your many books, but I thought you might give us your quick take on three of them. First of all, Skinny Dip. <laughs> well, I like the beginning of that book a lot, and I like, again, strong female character, Joey. She, she gets pushed off a cruise liner by her husband on their anniversary, and he thinks she's... Uh, he, he thinks she's, he's, got, he's done with it, but she, of course, is off the coast of Florida, so she's a swimmer, and she finds, she hooks, she grabs onto a bale of ma floating marijuana that's been dumped <laughs> on, and, and floats to an island, and then gets, starts hatching a plot for revenge. I like that book a lot. Nature Girl. Again, Honey Santana, very strong. It, it takes place in a, a part of Florida called the 10,000 Islands, mm -hmm. which is the last true wilderness of the Everglades, and, I, and that's why I set the book there. And there's an island called Dismal Key, Mm -hmm. And there really is a Dismal Key. I mean, and I was dying to set a book there because I love the name Dismal Key. And Star Island. Star Island, I was so sick of the paparazzi culture and the whole thing that I decided to create a paparazzi and, um, and, and uh, have something bad to happen to him. And, and, and that was really sort of a selfish thing. I mean, <laughs> you, he's not all bad. As he starts out in, as a legitimate journalist and he turns into this you know, vulture who chases around sort of the Britney Spears and the Lindsay mm -hmm. Lohans. But I also uh, wanted to use it as an excuse to write about South Beach a little bit, which is the silliest place on the planet, uh, the most pretentious, uh, you know, unproductive place on the planet. But it's the place that everybody identifies Miami with now. Mm -hmm. So it was a chance to do a sort of a riff on South Beach. <laughs> Newsweek has said that you're one of the few funny writers left in this country. Do you ever feel pressured to be funny? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been lucky because I've got such great readers and they, they uh, but they like to laugh a lot. Mm -hmm. I think everybody likes to laugh and it's a hard thing. Sometimes when you're writing, you don't feel particularly funny. Whatever may be going on in your life, you may not feel mm -hmm. like a laugh riot, but I know that that's what the readers want. And even in the kids' books I do, I, I mm -hmm. write these novels for, for kids, obviously, with themes that are a little mm -hmm. different from the grown-up books. But the characters are still kind of irrelevant. I mean, irre I mean you know, irreverent, excuse me. And, mm -hmm. and, and they have that same kind of smart-ass attitude that kids love. Mm -hmm. and they, and, but even in those books, I feel pressure. I, look, look at, you know, for all the lofty things that are said about novelist your job it's a job and your job is to entertain mm -hmm. your readers and, it, and if you can't get them to turn the page it doesn't matter how mm -hmm. brilliant you might be as a writer or how many what a brilliant idea is what amazing characters you created if you can't hook people and get them interested and engaged early on you're done mm -hmm. you it's a wasted mm -hmm. effort so uh, you know I feel that pressure yeah I want them to be engrossed I want them to care about the care and I want them to laugh on every page and yeah it's a hard thing to do sometimes you don't feel very funny were you intimidated at all when you wrote Hoot, your first children's book? I was. And you know what? I, when I wrote Hoot, it was an editor's idea. I thought they were crazy because to even ask me to do it based on, you know, the, <laughs> these books are pretty twisted books. Uh, you know, well. I'm not a well person, and I told them that. And they said, look, it, kids love this stuff. You're writing a lot, you write a lot about the environment, about wildlife, mm -hmm. about the importance of saving these little pieces of, of mm -hmm. your childhood that you remember. And it'll work. Uh, and and I had a, I have a really brilliant editor, and she said, here's what you don't do. The one thing you don't do writing for kids is you don't write down to them. Mm -hmm. Don't make mm -hmm. the mistake of writing down to them. Write eye-to-eye -eye level with them. And that's what I did. And Hoot was just going to be a one-book mm -hmm. knockoff, and, and I was going to give it to my nieces and my nephew, my stepson, mm -hmm. who were all about mm -hmm. that age at the time, and I'd think, if they loved it, I didn't care if it sold 10 mm -hmm. copies, mm -hmm. as long as they... Because they had a, then they would have a book that they could read that mm -hmm. had my name on it that I wouldn't be nervous about them seeing, and then it 
had caught on and did incredibly well. And so, and the letters I got were so overwhelming that I couldn't turn my back on that audience again. It was so rewarding to get these letters from these very bright, funny kids because it gives you hope. I mean, they're mm -hmm. reading. They're reading in this day and age with Xbox and iPhones and, and all the distractions, the video games that they have. They're still picking up books and reading them. And that's an audience that's very uh, important and precious. And so I, that's why I keep writing them. Do you think your young audience is maybe more responsive in some ways than your adult audience? Well, I think kids in general are more uh, expressive. I mean, when, when I was young and I loved to read, I would never have dreamed of sitting down and writing a letter to, to an author. I mean, I would have been too intimidated. But now kids don't think anything about it. They, I mean, they're so, they're expressive. They write these great letters and, and you get, I get just literally thousands of letters from kids. and. And it always, each one is a little bit of treasure because you think, you know, somebody mm -hmm. took the time to sit there. And I, mm -hmm. I, write, I try to write back to all of them. And, um, and I do think they're more apt than a grown-up mm -hmm. is to say. A, a grown-up might do an email or might do a Facebook post or something. But, but the, the kids, you know, really do get into it. And when the letters you get aren't just, hey, I liked your book. It's like front and back page, and then they'll mm -hmm. even draw a picture of like an owl from a hoot or something. It's, and it's, it's very, very cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, and thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.